Today I want to talk to you about taking risks with, with something all of us have in common, and it's this thing called time. Time is this amazing dimension. It's a dimension. It's the fourth dimension. It's a dimension that God created to help us understand him and his character and kind of have a frame of reference of things. And To me, time has always been fascinating. My great uncle was a watchmaker, so I grew up spending lots and lots of hours in his office listening to all of these clocks and watches just ticking and chiming, and I've always always been fascinated with it. I have far more clocks in my life than I possibly need. Right here on my platform this morning, I have a clock right up here so that I make sure that I don't go over time. I'll just tell you right now, we're going to go over time. All right, so anyway, uh, but it's amazing all the different ways we used to keep time. We have watches, we have clocks, we have calendars. Uh, a lot of you don't wear a wristwatch anymore. You just carry around the phone in your pocket. Uh, we, we tell time a lot of different ways. Um, there's this fascinating website. I would encourage you not to go there, especially while I'm preaching. Called uh, It's called, uh, uh, i got to look at my notes here, it's called deathclock.com. That's right, deathclock.com. You fill out some fields on there. It'll ask you questions about health, your age, where you live, all that kind of stuff. And it'll predict the date of your death. Doesn't that sound great? They're, they're, they see on there, it's this Internet's friendly reminder that life is slipping away. Yeah, it's a great little website. We say things all the time without even realizing it. Like, what time is it? Time is slipping away. Um, I lost track of time. Where does time go? Time seems to go so slow. Time seems to go so fast. Remember what it was like when you were a little kid and you were in school and you sat at your desk and you sat at your desk and you looked at the clock and it was 8.05 and you sat there and you did your math homework, you did your English homework, you did your spelling homework, you did all kinds of reading, you did history and you looked at the clock again and it was 8.06. Remember that? Remember how time just seemed to take forever and then you get to this certain age in your life and it's like, the, the hands and the clock could serve as a fan. They just go around so fast, you know. Time just seems to slip by us so quickly. It just goes by so fast. All of us in this room have one thing in common. We're all running out of time. And what we need to learn is to manage our time. Time is a gift that God gave to all of us. And what if, what if, what if we would take the most important things and people in our life and give them the most important time in our life? Just imagine how things in relationships or things with yourself or things around you in your world might change if the most important things got the most important time. All of us have this time. It is a gift. We can't change it. We can't alter it. We can't go into the future. We can't go into the past. All we can do is manage ourselves and how we use time. I'm going to tell you a story about a, a, a guy named Moses, and then we're going to look at one of the Psalms that he wrote. Um, Moses, uh, we've talked about him here in, in, in the past a little bit, but, but for 40 years, Moses was a shepherd. He started this career when he was 40 years old, and he did it for another 40 years. So for 40 years, Moses is a shepherd. I would imagine life cannot get too challenging as a shepherd. Oh, you got to defend the sheep maybe against a wild animal once in a while. Uh, but, but I'm thinking if you're a shepherd, you just walk with sheep, right? You sleep with sheep, you smell sheep, you smell like sheep, right? You get them to grass, you get it to some water, right? I would imagine that if you're a shepherd, Tuesday doesn't look a whole lot different than Sunday. I'm thinking Wednesday probably looks an awful lot like Saturday. And so 40 years, Moses is walking with sheep. And you know, if all you have to do is walk with sheep for 40 years, how many of you know you got time to think about life? You can get a little analytical about things. And um, I would imagine that over the years, Moses starts to think about life a little bit. And he's gone through this whole shepherd business one year. Now we're into it two years. We're in the third year, and we start to realize a pattern here. Certain times of the year are hot. Certain times of the year are cold. Sometimes it's wet. Sometimes it's dry. And uh, we just kind of analyze this whole thing and we start to get a different perspective. Now he's been shepherding for 10, 15, 20 years, and you don't start looking ahead anymore. You start kind of looking back. And all of us look at time differently, and it really depends on how old you are. See, when you're young, when you're young, time seems to go so slowly. The older you get, you realize that time is going more quickly. When you're young, you think time and everything is all about you. You think you're the point. It's all about you. Come on, come on, come on. All of us have been in a public place where there has been a little child screaming, yelling, 
making a tantrum, a whole lot of noise. Do you know why they do that? Because they think the world is all about them. And all of us were like that. And then somewhere in your teens, maybe, you get a little older, a little wiser, and you start to realize, maybe the world isn't all about me. Wait, I'm 16. Yes, it is. But then you get older still, all right? You get into your 20s. Maybe you started a family college career, and you start thinking about life a little bit different, time a little bit different. You got to get a career, marriage, family, that whole kind of thing. And then when you get into your 40s, you start to panic. You know, you get 43rd birthday, 40, 44. Like, that's older than my parents. Like, you become, I'm becoming my parents. And you look in the mirror and go, I look like my dad. You know, that whole kind of thing. And no longer when you've got a birthday now and a birthday comes up, you don't think about how old you are. You start thinking this. You, th you think about how much time is left until you're dead, right? You don't think about that when you're a kid, though. And so Moses is out there, and he gets this whole different perspective on life. And he writes this psalm. It's Psalm number 90. If you want to follow along in your Bible, we're going to get, we're going to get a revelation of, of what he thought about time. And here's what I want you to understand as we read this. It's all about context. We tend to look at life in the context of our timeline, the, the watch on our wrist, the calendar on our wall, our goals, our agenda, our plans. We start to look at life in our context. And when we do that, we can lose perspective so early, so easily, and it can look a little bit hopeless sometimes. And so what I want to do today as we look into Psalm number 90 is put your time, your life, in the context of God's clock, God's calendar, not yours. Because if you extract your calendar, your timeline, your life apart from God's, life can look a little bit meaningless and a lot hopeless. But suddenly when you place your life, your time frame, your timeline in the midst of God's big plan, you realize that there's a purpose for you. Psalm number 90, verse number one, he starts out and he says this. He says, look, Lord, through all the generations... He's looking back over time and thinking maybe about the future time. This is Moses, who's had a lot of time to think now. He says, in all those generations, you've been our home. Your version of the Bible might say you've been our dwelling place. Really what he's saying is this. God, you're a fixed point in time. You are unchanging and unchangeable. You might travel away from home. You might go into the military. You might go off to college, go off to school. You're traveling somewhere. The whole world can change and fall apart. But here's one thing you know. You want home to be there. You want your mama there. You want your bed there. You want your family there. You want nothing to change on the inside of that. He's saying that about God. You're the unchangeable, and we need that. We're fixed to that thing. Verse number two. He said, before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth, to the world, and from the beginning to the end, you are God. The key to that verse is beginning to the end, or from one version of the Bible says from everlasting to everlasting. He's saying, God, you have a whole separate, you've got a different time reference, a different time frame than we do in humanity. Before anything that we can see with our visible eyes was created, you were already there. You've always been there. He goes on to say in verse 3, you turn people back into dust saying, return to dust, you mortals. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? Because we know that we've all come out of the dust of the earth. Psalm 139 says that God looked at the dust of the earth and saw our unformed body. And then at some point in time, this body dies. The soul remains, but the body dies. And then when the body dies, eventually it returns to dust. And what he's saying in that verse is that, God, you're the author of life. You make it happen. You know when it's going to end. You're the authority. You're the one in charge. He says in verse number four, now here's where he kind of drills down and really talks about time, and we get an understanding of time from God's perspective. He said, for you, God, a thousand years are just like a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. Really what he's saying is this. Peter said it another way. He said, look, look, like he said, with God, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. That doesn't mean that when God checks off a day on his calendar, a thousand years in our life has gone by. It simply says this, that with, with God, time doesn't mean anything. Time is something that God created. He created the rocks, the trees, the birds, and he created time. It's a dimension that we live in, but God does not exist in a 24-hour clock like you and I do. To him, time means nothing. That's what he's saying in that verse. Verse number five, he says, you sweep people away like dreams that disappear. Isn't it amazing how you can wake up in the morning and a dream can be so vivid, it's right there, but by 10 o'clock in the morning, that dream is gone. It's already vanished. He says, people are kind of the same way. 
Our lives are a little bit like that. Look, if you came for encouragement today, let me encourage you with this. Uh, this is entertainment for my wife and I. Uh, a couple of months ago, we went walking through the cemetery in here in Williston, one of the cemeteries. Doesn't that sound like great? Anybody want to join us? Uh, and they, come on, laugh at me. You've done the same thing. Do you know why we go there? Because there's trees there, right? And we can walk amongst the trees. And here's what you notice about cemeteries. This is, this is an amazing thing. This is just after Memorial Day. In one part of the cemetery, the newer part of the cemetery, there was all kinds of flowers all over, and people put little solar lights out there and all kinds of chimes. But when you leave the, old, the, the new part of the cemetery and go to the old part of the cemetery, there's no more flowers over there. Do you know why? Because those people died so long ago, nobody knows them anymore. That's kind of what he's saying in this verse. Someday you're going to be, Dave, you're going to be in the grave and your wife is going to cry over you and put flowers on there and then eventually the grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids, nobody knew who grandpa was. Like, what do we got this big rock here? Move that out of the way. Let's use it for something else, right? We're just forgotten. How many are encouraged by that? Isn't that great? It's just awesome stuff. And then, and then verse number 10, he gets a little more specific now. Look what he says. 70 years are given to us. Some even maybe live to be 80, but, but even the best years are filled with, with, with pain and, and trouble, and, and soon they disappear, and, and we fly away. What he's saying is we might live to be 70 or 80 years old, but in the midst of 70, 80 years in our life, there's heartache and pain, but there's also joys in our life. And that's just life, isn't it? That's just life. That's just life. See, the older you get, you start to maybe, if, if, you don't, if you don't understand your life in perspective of God's time, it kind of looks like this. You're born, you go to school, you go to college, you get married, you have children, you retire, and then you die. Isn't that awesome? And guess what? If you believe in reincarnation, you get to do that all over again. But the next time you're a llama or a stink bug. I don't know. Okay, so that's the way that whole thing goes. But he says all of us live, we all have a lifespan. He says in verse number 11, who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Let me explain what he's saying there. Moses wanted to, us to understand how awesome, how grand, how big, how large, how powerful God is. And once you realize that, you stand in his glory. You stand back and get a perspective of God and his clock, his time, his power, and you stand back and look at all of that and go, wow, you are so big and I am so small. Moses one day stood on the mountain. He said, God, I want to see what you look like. And God said, nobody has ever seen God and lived. But he says, Moses, I'll make a special exception for you. You go up on that mountain. There's a little indentation in the side of that mountain. You go stand there. And when you're standing there, I'm going to put my hand over that spot, and I'm going to walk by. You can't look at my glory directly. You'll die because I'm so holy, and you're so human. And so Moses went up there and stood, and God passes by, and he took his hand off that Moses could see the backside of God. And his conclusion was, wow. What other conclusion could you possibly come to? And Moses says, you need to get that perspective and see the size of God so that you can see how your life has meaning and purpose and exists in God's great plan. And then, and then this is really the point that I want to get to in the next verse. I like the way the New International Version renders verse number 12. Look what he says. He says this finally. His conclusion is in verse 12. Lord, then when we stand back and see how big you are and that you have a time frame, you've got a timeline, you've got a plan, here's how we should respond. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days that we can gain a heart of wisdom. Now just stop for a moment and think about this. How, how, how big is your life in God's timeline? In God's timeline, your life and my life is like a drop of water that falls into a stream, that goes into a river, that flows into the ocean. And if we don't get a grip and a grasp of the immensity, the size, the purpose, and the plan of God, that can all look pretty hopeless. But when we realize that God brought us here and put us in his timeline with a plan and a purpose, suddenly our life has significance. When you're young, you think life is all about you. But when you get older, when you get older, you realize it isn't. 
You realize because you've got a different perspective. When you're young, when you're in your teens, your 20s, you're just looking ahead. You can't even imagine. I mean, when you're 21, 30 is ancient, right? It's like old. Like you're getting gray hair and hair growing in places you don't want it to grow, right? When, so you can't even imagine 30. But when you're 30, suddenly 40 is not very far away. And when you're 40, you're almost dead, right? So you start to look at life a little different. Instead of looking ahead, you start to look at the past. You start looking back. Your perspective changes. But if you put your life in the context of God's timeline, suddenly your life takes on a whole different significance. If you don't do that, it can look very hopeless and purposeless. People who continue to think that life is only about them tend to have not a very good reputation, and we don't want to hang around with them. They tend to be egotists or dictators. But suddenly when we put our lives in the context of God's timeline, life looks different. He says in this verse, look what he says, teach us to number our days. All of us in this room have numbered days. If you're a student in this room, you just numbered days not very long ago. You numbered days until school started, and now you're numbering days until school ends. We've numbered days until Christmas. We've numbered days until somebody comes home. We've numbered days until a birthday. We've numbered days until a wedding. We're, maybe some of you are numbering days until the next test in school. We've all, we've all numbered our days. And he says, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days until what? Until we die. That's really what he's saying. He's saying all of us have this gift of time. All of us are given this gift of time. And at some point in our life, hopefully we, we kind of have this uh, aha moment when we realize I've only got so much time to do the important things in my life. And so I need a heart of wisdom. I need a heart of wisdom so that I don't waste my time, that I don't misuse this gift that God has given me. We all get a certain amount of time. We can't change it. We can only change how we live and move and exist in the midst of that whole thing. And sometimes we need to take some risks with how we use our time. We need to take a risk of investing in our family, the risk of investing in our marriage, the risk of investing in our education, the risk of involving ourselves in better health. All of us have that gift and that opportunity. When the most important things in your life come first, it's amazing. When the most important things in your life come first, it's amazing how there's time for everything else in your life. Just think about this for a little bit. What if the important things in your life got the most important time? That's going to take a risk on your part, and you're going to have to do things a little different. Let me illustrate it for you a little bit like this. I just I love this illustration because we can all relate to something like this. We're going to use these containers to represent our lives. That's what we're going to do. We'll use these to represent. This is, this is your life. This is my life. We're going to use that to represent time. And then we're going, to use, we're going to use the sand in here to represent how we use our time. That's what we're going to do with that. So I, I decided to use sand to represent how we use time because uh, like sand's through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. So I, I couldn't resist. So just think about how you use your time. It doesn't matter how old you are or your marital status. All, I mean, just think about this. I mean, there's, there's um, let's see, Pinterest, 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 FaceTime, Facebook, 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 Hulu, Hulu, Netflix, surf the web, surf the web. If you're over 50, take a nap, take a nap. Okay, got to take a nap. Okay, uh, there's time with my friends. Got to go spend some time with my friends. Oh, yeah, Pinterest, Pinterest, surf the net, surf the web. TV, 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 TV. And then that's how we use our time. And then at some point in time, we realize, you know what? I really would love to do something better for myself. I think I should, I should probably educate myself. I need to take better care of my, my brain, my mind, maybe even my body. And so somewhere in the line, we think, you know what? I need, I need to make exercise or education a priority. And you can see by the size of this rock, it's not a big priority. <laughs> But it's there nonetheless. So we, we think that, that should be a part of my life. That's, I should probably spend time doing that kind of stuff as well. Oh, and then um, maybe you're dating somebody. You're dating somebody today. So uh, you've you got to have some time. There's, it's important that I have time for the boyfriend, the girlfriend. If you're married, I should 
probably have some spouse time in there, you know, but boy, so we, we try to shove that in our life and have time for that. And then if you're, if you're uh, with family, it's important that you have some family time. We'd be good. I mean, the kids need some time, and so we, we got to spend some time with the kids. Oh, and then, of course, let's not forget one of the most important things that we need to put into our, God's got to be a part of our life, right? So we got to get God into our life. We've got to have some church time, some devotional time, Bible reading time, helping out in the church kind of time. But, ooh, there just doesn't seem to be enough, say it with me, time, right? And this happens to the pastor all the time. What I'm about to say is going to make some of you nervous and uncomfortable and maybe a little bit mad. One of the things all of us in this room have in common is all of us have to go to Walmart, right? Okay, so here's what's going to happen. This, this is your life right here. This is your, and, and, and it seems like the God rock seems to just kind of get so low on the, the priority list, and so it's not there. And so now you haven't been in church for one, two, three, four Sundays, a couple of months, a whole kind of thing, and you get to Walmart, and then, and then there through the corner of your eye, it's Pastor Chris and Robin. So you say to your wife, look, look, Ethel, don't look. Don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Ethel, don't look. Don't look. Oh, you looked and he saw us. Oh, great, you know. And so here comes Pastor Chris over there. Hey, how you doing? And it's the awkward handshake because you know what he wants to ask, right? He wants to ask you if you're backsliding or just plain lazy. Anyway, so you shake hands, right, that whole kind of thing. And then you feel like you need to justify yourself. Oh, we have just been so, say it with me busy. Yeah, you know, Aunt Edna had a boil. We had to watch that get popped, you know. And uh, the kids, they're in badminton club now, so we've been going to that whole kind of thing. Oh, 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 and then we bought a boat. Well, you know, it's an investment, and God wants us to use our money wisely, and so the only time to use the boat is on Sundays, coincidentally, after I preached this uh, message the last uh, service, one guy met me at the back here and says, I just about went fishing today. And then, you know, um, but I came to church and said, and you know, the kids are in, in all these sports, we've got stuff going, and then the, I just work, and it's the only day that we have as a family, and you kind of go through that whole thing. And so, and so the God rock kind of gets kind of low priority in the whole thing, doesn't it? And you find there's just not enough room in your life for all the things that you know you need to give time to. But just think about this. What if, what if the most important things in your life, what if the most important things in your life were first in your life? What if you said, you know what, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to take a risk with time. And I realize that tomorrow I'm going to get up at the crack of 9 a.m. and start exercising, right? Okay? I'm going to sign up for those classes and I'm going to be a part of that whole kind of thing. You put that in there first. You say, you know what, honey? Our marriage has been suffering. And I realize the reason our marriage has been suffering is because I have not given you the priority that you deserve. I did when we were dating. I mean, nothing else in life mattered. All I could think about was you. I wrote your letters. I bought your flowers. I put love notes on the mirror, that whole kind of thing. Remember that? Remember that? Remember that? But it just seems like in life, you've just kind of slidden down the priority list a little bit. So, honey, I... I know that I need to give you some more time, and so I'm going to give you some priority. And then you said, you know what, kids? Dad's been playing a lot of video games alone. He's been under the hood of the car, working on the motor. He's been busy with the career, busy with the job, been out of town, playing with my toys, out hunting, fishing, doing my own thing. Kids, I realized we need to spend more time together. And so you start to prioritize family time. And then you say, you know what? God's not going to fall to the end. He's not going to get my leftovers on time anymore. God, I need to get up in the morning. I need to spend time with you, reading, praying, talking to you. I need to be involved in my church and the life of the church. And you start to prioritize those things with God, and you put that in there first. And that's all good. And you know what? And then we still want to do things with um, Facebook, <laughs> Hulu, Netflix, Pinterest, friends, eating, entertainment, hanging out with the buddies, hunting, fishing, and isn't it amazing that when we prioritize our time, there just seems to be room for everything that we want to do? What if the most important things in your life got the most important time in your life? Just think how that could revolutionize your marriage. If suddenly your marriage got more priority than it's getting right now. Imagine if your health suddenly became more of a priority than it is. Could it change the way you start to live your life? Imagine for just a moment if your children got more pride. There's problems in their life because here's what goes on. I, I tell you, I illustrate the whole thing in, in the God rock. There's just not room for the God rock. And then suddenly there's a crisis in the family. 
My kid's left the faith. My kid doesn't want to be in church. My kid hates me. You should hear what's coming out of my kid's mouth. Suddenly, there's room for that God rock in our life. What if we put the God rock in first? Maybe we would avoid some of the heartache and the pain. Pastor, I don't know what to do. My wife wants to leave. She's just gave me an ultimatum. She says, either change, change this, change that change myself. She's threatened me with a divorce. She wants to walk out of the house. What am I supposed to do? What if the God rock was a priority? Because now it's a priority, isn't it? Happens all the time. Pastor, the doctor's diagnosed me, and I've only got so long to live, and he says, I've got this heart problem, and I'm overweight, and yada, yada, yada. What if suddenly we put that rock in first, because it's a priority now, isn't it? Happens to us all the time. God, I'm in a desperate situation. I don't know what to do. I'm beyond myself. I don't have an answer for this. And we start to cry out to God, oh God, please help me. Get me out of this financial mess. What if your finances got some priority? Because you know what? When the financial crisis, all of a sudden when there's a financial crisis, now that that becomes a priority. What if we prioritize the most important things in our life before, before, uh, before it became a crisis? What if the most important things became the most important things first. It could change, it could revolutionize your marriage, your home, your finances, your family, but it's going to take a risk on your part. But every time we take those risks on God especially, it's amazing how God rewards with a blessing. He rewards with a blessing. All of you can do it. It'll change your family. It'll change your home. It'll change your inner peace. It'll change relationships. It'll change the way you manage money. All of that. And do you know why we need to put the most important things in our life first? Because (laughs) one day, we're out of time. And it's all gone. So why not put ourselves into God's time frame and understand there's a, a reason that God has entrusted us with the valuable resources like family, faith, children, marriage, and see the blessings that come. 